Autoeroticism, a study of the spontaneous manifestations of the sexual impulse, part 3, section 4, of Studies in the Psychology of Sex, volume 1, by Havelock Ellis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by John Thomas Coos Kuzmarski. John Thomas Coos. Autoeroticism, a study of the spontaneous manifestations of the sexual impulse, part three, section four. Judging from my own observations among both sexes, I should say that in normal persons, well past the age of puberty and otherwise leading a chaste life, masturbation would be little practiced except for the physical and mental relief it brings. Many vigorous and healthy unmarried women or married women apart from their husbands living a life of sexual abstinence have asserted emphatically that only by sexually exciting themselves at intervals could they escape from a condition of nervous oppression and sexual obsession which they felt to be a state of hysteria in most cases this happens about the menstrual period and whether accomplished as a purely physical act in the same way as they would soothe a baby to sleep by rocking it or patting it, or by the cooperation of voluptuous mental imagery, the practice is not cultivated for its own sake during the rest of the month. In illustration of the foregoing statements, I will here record a few typical observations of experiences with regard to masturbation. The cases selected are all women, and are all in a fairly normal and, for the most part, excellent state of health. Some of them, however, belong to somewhat neurotic families, and these are persons of unusual mental ability and intelligence. Observation 1. Unmarried, aged 38. She is very vigorous and healthy, of a strongly passionate nature, but never masturbated until a few years ago, where she was made love to by a man who used to kiss her, etc. Although she did not respond to these advances, she was thrown into a state of restless sexual excitement. On one occasion, when in bed in this restless state, she accidentally found, on passing her hand over her body, that by playing with a round thing, clitoris, a pleasurable feeling was produced. She found herself greatly relieved and quieted by these manipulations. Though there remained a feeling of tiredness afterward, she has sometimes masturbated six times in a night, especially before and after the menstrual period, until she was unable to produce the orgasm or any feeling of pleasure. Observation 2 unmarried, age 45, of rather nervous temperament. She has for many years been accustomed, usually about a week before the appearance of the menses, to obtain sexual relief by kicking out her legs when lying down. In this way, she says, she obtains complete satisfaction. She never touches herself. On the following day, she frequently has pains over the lower part of the abdomen, such pains being apparently muscular and due to the exertion. Observation 3. Age 29, recently married, belonging to a neurotic and morbid family, herself healthy, and living usually in the country, vivacious, passionate, enthusiastic, intellectual, and taking a prominent part in philanthropic schemes and municipal affairs at the same time fond of society and very attractive to men. For many years she had been accustomed to excite herself, though she felt it was not good for her. The habit was merely practiced faute de mieux. I used to sit on the edge of the bed sometimes, she said, and it came over me so strongly that I simply couldn't resist it. I felt that I should go mad, and I thought it was better to touch myself than be insane. I used to press my clitoris in. It made me very tired afterward, not like being with my husband. The confession was made from a conviction of the importance of the subject, and with the hope that some way might be found out of the difficulties which so often beset women. Observation 4. Unmarried, aged 
twenty-seven possesses much force of character and high intelligence is actively engaged in a professional career as a child of seven or eight she began to experience what she describes as lightning-like sensations mere vague uneasy feelings or momentary twitches which took place alike in the vulva or the vagina or the uterus not amounting to an orgasm and nothing like it the sensations it should be added have continued into adult life i always experienced them just before menstruation and afterward for a few days and occasionally though it seems to me not so often during the period itself i may have the sensation four or five times during the day it is not dependent at all upon external impressions or my own thoughts and is sometimes absent for days together it is just one flash as if you would snap your fingers and it is over as a child she was of course quite unconscious that there was anything sexual in these sensations they were then usually associated with various imaginary scenes the one usually indulged in was that a black bear was waiting for her up in a tree and that she was slowly raised up toward the bear by means of ropes and then lowered again and raised feeling afraid of being caught by the bear and yet having a morbid desire to be caught in after years she realized that there was a physical sexual cause underlying these imaginations and that what she light was a feeling of resistance to the bear giving rise to the physical sensation at a somewhat later age though while still a child she cherished an ideal passion for a person very much older than herself this passion absorbing her thoughts for a period of two years during which however there was no progress made in physical sensation it was when she was nearly thirteen years of age soon after the appearance of menstruation and under the influence of this ideal passion that she felt learned to experience conscious orgasm which was not associated with the thought of any person i did not associate it with anything high or beautiful owing to the fact that i had imbibed our current ideas in regard to sexual feelings and viewed them in a very poor light indeed she considers that her sexual feelings were stronger at this period than at any other time in her life she could however often deny herself physical satisfaction for weeks at a time in order that she might not feel worthy of the object of her ideal passion as for the sexual satisfaction she writes it was experimental i had heard older girls speak of the pleasure of such feelings and i was not taught anything by example or otherwise i merely rubbed myself with the wash rag while bathing waiting for a result and having the same peculiar feeling i had so often experienced i am not aware of any ill effects having resulted but i felt degraded and tried hard to overcome the habit no one had spoken to me of the habit but from the secrecy of grown people and passages i had heard from the bible i conceived the idea that it was a reprehensible practice and i vowed that each time should be the last i was often able to keep the resolution for two or three weeks some four years later she gradually succeeded in breaking herself of the practice in so far as it had become a habit she has however acquired a fuller knowledge of sexual matters and though she was still a great dread of masturbation as a vice she does not hesitate to relieve her physical feelings when it seems best to her to do so i am usually able to direct my thoughts from these sensations she writes but if they seem to make me irritable or wakeful i relieve myself it is a physical act unassociated with deep feeling of any kind i have always felt that it was a rather unpleasant compromise with my physical nature but certainly necessary in my case yet i have abstained from gratification for very long periods if the feeling is not strong at the menstrual period i go on very well without either the sensation or the gratification until the next period 
period. And strange as it may seem, the best antidote I have found, and the best preventive, is to think about spiritual things or someone whom I love. It is simply a matter of training, I suppose, a sort of mental gymnastics which draws the attention away from the physical feelings this lady has never had any sexual relationships and since she is ambitious and believes that the sexual emotions may be transformed so as to become a source of motive power throughout the whole of life she wishes to avoid such relationships Observation 5. Unmarried, age 31, in good health, with, however, a somewhat hysterical excess of energy. When I was about 26 years of age, she writes, a friend came to me with the confession that for several years she had masturbated, and had become such a slave to the habit that she severely suffered from its ill effects. At that time I had never heard of self-abuse by women. I listened to her story with much sympathy and interest but some skepticism, and determined to try experiments upon myself, with the idea of getting to understand the matter in order to assist my friend. After some manipulation, I succeeded in awakening what had before been unconscious and unknown. I purposefully allowed the habit to grow upon me, and one night, for I always operated upon myself before going to sleep, never in the morning, I obtained considerable pleasure, satisfaction, but the following day my conscience awoke. I also felt pain located at the back of my head, and then began again somewhat regularly, once a month, a few days after menstruation. During those months, months in which I exercised moderation, I think I obtained much local relief with comparatively little injury. But later on, finding myself in robust health, I increased my experiments. The habit grew upon me, and it was only with an almost superhuman effort that I broke myself free. Needless to say that I gave no assistance to my suffering friend, nor did I ever refer to the subject after her confession fashion to me. Some two years later I heard of sexual practices between women as a frequent habit in certain quarters. I again interested myself in masturbation, for I had been told something that led me to believe that there was much more for me to discover. Not knowing the most elementary physiology, I questioned some of my friends, and then commenced again. I restricted myself to relief from local congestion and irritation by calling forth the emission of mucus, rather than by seeking pleasure. At the same time, I sought to discover what manipulation of the clitoris would lead to. The habit grew upon me with startling rapidity, and I became more or less its slave. But I suffered from no very great ill effects until I started in search of more discoveries. I found that I was a complete ignoramus as to the formation of a woman's body, and by experiments upon myself sought to discover the vagina. I continued my operations until I obtained an entrance. I thought the rough handling of myself during this final stage disturbed my nervous system, and caused me considerable pain and exhaustion at the back of my head, the spinal column, the back of my eyes, and a general feeling of languor, etc. I could not bear to be the slave of a habit, and after much suffering and efforts, which only led to falls to lower depths of conscious failure, my better self rebelled until, by a great effort and much prayer, I kept myself pure for a whole week. This partial recovery gave me hope, but then I again fell a victim to the habit, much to my chagrin, and became hopeless of ever retracing my steps toward my ideal of virtue. For some days I lost energy, spirit, and hope. My nervous system appeared to be ruined, but I did not really despair of victory in the end. I thought of all the drunkards chained by their intemperate habits of inveterate smokers who could not exist without tobacco, and of all the various methods by which men were slaves, and the longing to be freed of what had, in my case, proved to be a painful and unnecessary habit, increased daily until, after one night, when I struggled with myself for hours, I believed I had finally succeeded. 
at times when i reached a high degree of sexual excitement i felt that i was at least one step removed from those of morbid and repressed sex who had not the slightest suspicion of the latent joys of womanhood within them. For a little while the habit took the shape of an exalted passion, but I rapidly tired it out by rough, thoughtless, and too impatient handling. Revulsion set in with the pain of an exhausted and badly used nervous system, and finding myself the slave of a passion, I determined to endeavor to be its master in conclusion i should say that masturbation has proved itself to be to me one of the blind turnings of my life's history from which i have gained much valuable experience the practice was however by no means thus dismissed some time later the subject writes i have again restarted masturbation for the relief of localized feelings one morning i was engaged in reading a very heavy volume which for convenience sake i held in my lap leaning back on my chair i had become deep in my study for an hour or so when i became aware of certain feelings roused by the weight of the book being tempted to see what would happen by such conduct i shifted so that the edge of the volume came in closer contact the pleasurable feelings increased so i gave myself up to my emotions for some thirty minutes notwithstanding the intense pleasure I enjoyed for so long a period, I maintain that it is wiser to refrain, and although I admit in the same breath that, by gentle treatment, such pleasure may be harmless to the general health, it does not lead to a desire for solitude, which is not conducive to a happy frame of mind. There is an accompanying reticence of speech concerning the pleasure, which therefore appears to be unnatural, like the eating of a stolen fruit. After such an event, one seems to require to fly to the woods, and to listen to the song of birds as to shake off after effects in a letter dated some months later she writes i think i have arisen above the masturbation habit in the same letter the writer remarks if i had consciously abnormal or unsatisfied appetites i would satisfy them in the easiest and least harmful way again eighteen months later she writes it is curious to note that for months this habit is forgotten but awakens sometimes to self-assertion if a feeling of pressure is felt in the head and a slight irritation elsewhere and experience shows that the time has come for pacification, exquisite pleasure can be enjoyed, never more than twice a month, and sometimes less often. Observation 6. Unmarried, actively engaged in the practice of her profession. Well-developed feminine in contour, but boyish in manner and movements, strong, though muscles small, and healthy, with sound nervous system, never had anemia, thick brown hair, and hair on toes and legs up to umbilicus. It began to appear at the age of ten, before pubic hair, and continued until eighteen. A few stray hairs round nipples, and much dark down on upper lip, as well as light down on arms and hands. Hips normal, nate small, labia minora large, and clitoris deeply hooded, hymen thick, vagina probably small, considerable pigmentation of parts. Menstruation began at fifteen, but not regular till seventeen. Is painless and scanty. The better the state of health, the less it is. No change of sexual or other feelings connected with it. It lasts one to three days. I believe, she writes, my first experience of physical sex sensations was when I was about sixteen and in sleep. But I did not then recognize it, and seldom, indeed, gave the subject of sex a thought. I was a child far beyond the age of childhood. The accompanying dreams were disagreeable, but I cannot remember what they were about. It was not until I was nearly nineteen that I knew the sexual organism in my waking state. It surprised me completely, but I knew that I had known it before in my sleep. The knowledge came one summer when I was leading a rather isolated life, and my mind was far from sex subjects, being deep in books, Carlyle, Ruskin, Huxley, Darwin, Scott, etc. I noticed that when I got up in the morning, I felt very hot and uncomfortable. The clitoris and the parts around were swollen and erect, and often tender and painful. I had no idea what it was, but found I was unable to pass my water for an hour or two. 
One day, when I was straining a little to pass water, the full orgasm occurred. The next time it happened, I tried to check it by holding myself firmly, of course, with the opposite result. I do not know that I found it highly pleasurable, but it was a very great relief. I allowed myself a good many experiments to come to a conclusion in the matter, and I thought about it. I was much too shy to speak to anyone, and thought it was probably a sin. I tried not to do it, and not to think about it, saying to myself that surely I was lord of my body. But I found that the matter was not entirely under my control. However unwilling or passive I might be, there were times when the involuntary discomfort was not in my keeping. My touching myself, or not, did not save me from it. Because it sometimes gave me pleasure, I thought it might be a form of self-indulgence, and did not do it until it could scarcely be helped. Soon the orgasm began to occur fairly frequently in my sleep, perhaps once or twice a week. I had no erotic dreams, then or at any other time, but I had nights of restless sleep and woke as it occurred, dreaming that it was happening, as, in fact, it was. At times I hardly awoke, but went to sleep again in a moment. I continued for two or three years to be sorely tried by day at frequent intervals. I acquired a remarkable degree of control, so that, though one touch or steadily directed thought would have caused the orgasm, I could keep it off and go to sleep without wrong-doing. Of course, when I fell asleep, my control ended. All this gave me a good deal of physical worry, and kept my attention unwillingly fixed upon the matter. I do not think my body was readily irritable, but I had unquestionably very strong sexual impulses. After a year or two, when I was working hard, I could not afford the attention the control cost me, or the prolonged, mitigated sexual excitement it caused. I took drugs for a time, but they lost effect, produced lassitude, and agreed with me badly. I therefore put away my scruples, and determined to try the effect of giving myself an instant and business-like relief. Instead of allowing my feelings to gather strength, I satisfied them out of hand. Instead of five hours of heat and discomfort, I did not allow myself five minutes if I could help it. The effect was marvelous. I practically had no more trouble. The thing rarely came to me at all by day, and though it continued at times by night, it became less frequent and less strong. Often it did not wake me. The erotic images and speculations that had begun to come to me died down. I left off being afraid of my feelings, or indeed thinking about them. I may say that I had decided that I should be obliged to lead a single life, and that the less I thought about matters of sex, the more easy I should find life. Later on I had religious ideas which helped me considerably in many ideals of a decent, orderly, self-contained life. I do not lay stress on these, they were not at all emotional, and my physical and psychical development do not appear to have run much on parallel lines. I had a strong moral sense before I had a religious one, and a common sense which I perhaps trusted more than either. When I was about twenty-eight, I thought I might perhaps leave off the habit of regular relief I had got into. It was not regular as regards time, being anything from one day to six weeks. The change was probably made easier by a severe illness I had had. I gave this abstinence a fair trial for several years, until I was about thirty-four. But my nocturnal manifestations certainly gathered strength, especially when I got much better in health, and finally, as at puberty, began to worry my waking life. I reasoned that by my attempt at abstinence I had only exchanged control for uncontrol, and reverted to my old habits of relief, with the same good results as before. The whole trouble subsided, and I got better at once. The orgasm during sleep continued, and occurs about once a fortnight. It is increased by change of air, especially at the seaside, when it may occur on two or three nights running. I decided that, for the proper control of my single life, relief was normal and right. It would be very difficult for anyone to demonstrate the contrary to me. My aim has always been to keep myself in the best condition of physical and mental balance that a single person is capable of. 
There is some interest in briefly reviewing the remarkable transformations in the attitude toward masturbation from Greek times down to our day. The Greeks treated masturbation with little opprobrium. At the worst, they regarded it as unmanly, and Aristophanes, in various passages, connects the practice with women, children, slaves, and feeble old men. Aeschines seems to have publicly brought it as a charge against Demosthenes, and he had practiced masturbation, though, on the other hand, Plutarch tells us that Diogenes, described by Zeller, the historian of Greek philosophy, as the most typical figure of ancient Greece, was praised by Chrysippus, the famous philosopher, for masturbating in the marketplace. The most strenuous Romans, at all events, as exemplified by Juvenal and Martial, condemned masturbation more vigorously. Arateus, without alluding to masturbation, dwells on the tonic effects of retaining the semen, but, on the other hand, Galen regarded the retention of semen as injurious and advocated its frequent expulsion, a point of view which tended to justify masturbation. In classical days, doubtless, masturbation and all other forms of the autoerotic impulse were comparatively rare. So much scope was allowed in early adult age for homosexual and later for heterosexual relationships that any excessive or morbid development of solitary self-indulgence could seldom occur. The case was altered when Christian ideals became prominent. Christian morality strongly prescribed sexual relationships except under certain specified conditions. It is true that Christianity discouraged all sexual manifestations and that therefore its ban fell equally on masturbation, but obviously masturbation lay at the weakest line of defense against the assaults of the flesh. It was there that resistance would most readily yield. Christianity thus probably led to a considerable increase of masturbation. The attention which the theologians devoted to its manifestations clearly bears witness to their magnitude. It is noteworthy that Mohammedan theologians regarded masturbation as a Christian vice. In Islam, both doctrine and practice tended to encourage sexual relationships, and not much attention was paid to masturbation, nor even any severe reprobation directed against it. Omar Haleby remarks that certain theologians of Islam are inclined to consider the practice of masturbation in vogue among Christians as allowable to devout Muslims when alone on a journey. He himself regards this as a practice good neither for soul nor body, seminal omissions during sleep providing all necessary relief. Should, however, a Muslim fall into this error, God is merciful. In Theodore's penitential of the 7th century, 40 days penance is prescribed for masturbation. Aquinas condemned masturbation as worse than fornication, though less heinous than other sexual offenses against nature. In opposition also to those who believed that distillatio usually takes place without pleasure, he observed that it was often caused by sexual emotion, and should therefore always be mentioned to the confessor. Liguori also regarded masturbation as a graver sin than fornication, and even said that distillatio, if voluntary and with notable physical commotion, is without doubt a mortal sin, for in such a case it is the beginning of a pollution. On the other hand, some theologians have thought that distillatio may be permitted, even if there is some commotion, so long as it has not been voluntarily procured. And Caramule, who has been described as a theological enfant terrible, declared that natural law does not forbid masturbation. But that proposition was condemned by Innocent the Eleventh. The most enlightened modern Catholic view is probably represented by De Bruyne, who, after remarking that he has known pious and intelligent persons who had an irresistible impulse to masturbate, continues, Must we excuse or condemn these people? Neither the one nor the other. If you condemn and repulse, absolutely, these persons are altogether guilty against their own convictions. You will perhaps throw them into despair.
if on the contrary you completely excuse them you maintain them in a disorder from which they may perhaps never emerge adopt a wise middle course and perhaps with god's aid you may often cure them under certain circumstances some catholic theologians have permitted a married woman to masturbate thus the jesuit theologian gurry asserts that the wife does not sin quo se ipsum tactibus excitat ad seminatium statim post copulem in caver solis seminavit this teaching seems to have been misunderstood since ethical and even medical writers have expended a certain amount of moral indignation on the church whose theologians committed themselves to this statement as a matter of fact this qualified permission to masturbate merely rests on a false theory of procreation which is clearly expressed in the word seminatio it was believed that ejaculation in the woman is as necessary to fecundation as ejaculation in the man galen avicenna and aquinas recognized indeed that such feminine semination was not necessary sanchez however was doubtful while sores and zacchia following hippocrates regarded it as necessary as sexual intercourse without fecundation is not approved by the catholic church it thus became logically necessary to permit women to masturbate whenever the ejaculation of mucus had not occurred at or before coitus the belief that the emission of vaginal mucus under the influence of sexual excitement in women corresponded to spermatic emission has led to the practice of masturbation on hygienic grounds garnier celibat page two five five mentions that Messu in the eighteenth century invented a special pessary to take the place of the penis and as he stated affect the due explosion of the feminine sperm protestantism no doubt in the main accepted the general catholic tradition but the tendency of protestantism in reaction against the minute inquisition of the earlier theologians has always been to exercise a certain degree of what is regarded as wholesome indifference toward the less obvious manifestations of the flesh thus in protestant countries masturbation seems to have been almost ignored until tisset combining with his reputation as a physician the fanaticism of a devout believer raised masturbation to the position of a colossal bogey which during a hundred years has not only had an unfortunate influence on medical opinion in these matters but has been productive of incalculable harm to ignorant youth and tender consciences during the past forty years the efforts of many distinguished physicians a few of whose opinions i have already quoted have gradually dragged the bogey down from its pedestal and now as i have ventured to suggest there is a tendency for the reaction to be excessive there is even a tendency today to regard masturbation with various qualifications as normal Rami de gourmont for instance considers that masturbation is natural because it is the method by which fishes procreate all things considered it must be accepted that masturbation is part of the doings of nature a different conclusion might be agreeable but in every ocean and under the reeds of every river myriads of beings would protest Tillier remarks that since masturbation appears to be universal among the higher animals we are not entitled to regard it as a vice it has only been so considered because studied exclusively by physicians under abnormal conditions hearth while asserting that masturbation must be strongly repressed in the young regards it as a desirable method of relief for adults and especially under circumstances for women venturi a well-known italian alienist on the other hand regards masturbation as strictly physiological in youth it is the normal and natural passage toward the generous and healthy passion of early manhood it only becomes abnormal and vicious he holds when continued into adult life the appearance of masturbation at puberty venturi considers is a moment in the course of the development of the function of that organ which is the necessary instrument of sexuality it finds its motive in the satisfaction of an organic need having much analogy with that which arises from the 
tickling a very sensitive cutaneous surface in this masturbation of early adolescence lies according to venturi the germ of what will later be love a pleasure of the body and of the spirit following the relief of a satisfied need as the youth develops onanism becomes a sexual act comparable to coitus as a dream is comparable to reality imagery forming in correspondence with the desires in its fully developed form in adolescence venturi continues masturbation has an almost hallucinatory character onanism at this period psychically approximates to the true sexual act and passes insensibly into it if however continued on into adult age it becomes morbid passing into erotic fetishism what in the inexperienced youth is the natural auxiliary and stimulus to imagination in the degenerate onanist of an adult age is a sign of arrested development thus onanism the author concludes is not always a vice such as is fiercely combated by educators and moralists it is the natural transition by which we reach the warm and generous love of youth and in natural succession to this the tranquil positive matrimonial love of the mature man silvio venturi le degenerazioni psico sessual eighteen ninety two page six to nine it may be questioned whether this view is acceptable even for the warm climate of the south of europe where the impulses of sexuality are undoubtedly precocious it is certainly not in harmony with general experience and opinion in the north this is well expressed in the following passage by edward carpenter international journal of ethics july eighteen ninety nine after all purity in the sense of continence is of the first importance to boyhood to prolong the period of continence in a boy's life is to prolong the period of growth this is a simple psychological law and a very obvious one and whatever other things may be said in favor of purity it remains perhaps the most weighty to introduce sensual and sexual habits and one of the worst of them is self-abuse at an early age is to arrest growth both physical and mental and what is even more it means to arrest the capacity for affection all experience shows that the early outlet toward sex cheapens and weakens affectional capacity i do not consider that we can decide the precise degree in which masturbation may fairly be called normal so long as we take masturbation by itself we are thus in conclusion brought back to the point which i sought to emphasize at the outset masturbation belongs to a group of autoerotic phenomena from one point of view it may be said that all autoerotic phenomena are unnatural since the natural aim of the sexual impulse is sexual conjunction and all exercise of that impulse outside such conjunction is away from the end of nature but we do not live in a state of nature which answers to such demands all our life is unnatural and as soon as we begin to restrain the free play of sexual impulse toward sexual ends at once autoerotic phenomena inevitably spring up on every side there is no end to them it is impossible to say what finest elements in art in morals in civilization generally may not really be rooted in an autoerotic impulse without a certain overheating of the sexual system said nietzsche we could not have a raphael autoerotic phenomena are inevitable it is our wisest course to recognize this inevitableness of sexual and transmuted sexual manifestations under the perpetual restraints of civilized life and while avoiding any attitude of excessive indulgence or indifference to avoid also any attitude of excessive horror for our horror not only leads to the facts being effectually veiled from our sight but also itself serves to manufacture 
artificially a greater evil than that which we seek to combat the sexual impulse is not as some have imagined the sole root of the most massive human emotions the most brilliant human aptitudes of sympathy of art of religion in the most complex human organism where all the parts are so many fibred and so closely interwoven no great manifestation can be reduced to one single source but it largely enters into and moulds all of these emotions and aptitudes and that by virtue of its two most peculiar characteristics it is in the first place the deepest and most volcanic of human impulses and in the second place unlike the only other human impulse with which it can be compared the nutritive impulse it can to a large extent be transmuted into a new force capable of the strangest and most various uses so that in the presence of all these manifestations we may assert that in a real sense though subtly mingled with very diverse elements autoeroticism everywhere plays its part in the phenomena of autoeroticism when we take a broad view of those phenomena we are concerned not with a form of insanity not necessarily with a form of depravity but with the inevitable by-products of that mighty process on which the animal creation rests end of autoeroticism part three section four recording by john thomas coos kuzmarski john thomas coos www.validateyourlife.com